Glad you're here today. How many enjoyed uh, Dave Hertwick sharing last Sunday? Just a phenomenal communicator. Such a remarkable guy. I love any time we have a, a, a chance to have him in the house. And uh, Susan and I were able to spend uh, a couple of days with our granddaughter and our daughter and son-in-law too. And uh, by the way, I don't know if you know this, uh, today the Buffalo Bills are playing uh, the uh, Eagles at one o'clock. So special prayers are appreciated. And I don't know if you know this, but our executive pastor, Jonathan Sigmund, is an Eagles fan. <laughs> wow. And he's at the game. So please pray for his protection, because <laughs> Bill's fans are not knowing for having, you know, the most class. Let's just say that. Uh, just a couple of things to make you aware of. Uh, this last summer, our church family participated in a drive uh, to uh, bring in some supplies to send to a, uh, two schools in Jamaica. And uh, what I wanted you to know is that as a result of your contributions, over 600 students were served. By the way, that's more students that were in the two schools. So when the students in the schools were taken care of, they actually opened it up to the community and helped some other students as well. So I just want to say thank you for your generosity. Also wanted to remind you, um, if you would like to partner with us in our expansion project, uh, there's information in your seat back pocket about how you can do that. It's one thing to walk into a new space and be impressed by it. It's another thing to walk into a new space and feel like you had a part of it. So we're inviting you to join us with that second part if you haven't already done so. This morning we are in uh, concluding our series called More and Less. More or less stuff, more or less regret, more or less distraction, more or less control. Today we're going to talk about more or less bitterness. And we're looking at two passages in Scripture that specifically identify bitterness. The first is in Hebrews 12 where it says... Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. And then in Ephesians 4, it says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice, be kind and compassionate to one another. What's the next word? Forgiving yeah, each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. If you've ever been with me when I'm out uh, at a restaurant, uh, there's a beverage that I typically order. It's diet, and, uh, but it's not 7-Up. And I can tell you why it's not 7-Up. I used to drink a lot of 7-Up, but someone did something to me regarding 7-Up uh, that I've never been able to forget. I'm not saying whether I forgave them or not, but uh, uh, you all know that my powers of oblivion approach superpower status. It's just things I don't notice. Someone had gone into my refrigerator, emptied the 7-Up out of the bottle, and replaced it with vinegar. <laughs> yep. And so uh, I remember noticing that when I turned the cap, it didn't go like it's supposed to, but I really, I, like I said, my powers of oblivion are, are pretty powerful, and so I just took a great big swig. I didn't swallow it, but I didn't spit it out either. I was in a place where that would not have been appropriate, and it took me just a, a few seconds, which felt like a very long time to get to a place where I could get rid of it, and uh, they watched me run by while I was trying to hold this stuff in my mouth, and, and so I don't drink 7-Up anymore. It left a bitter taste in my mouth. We've all had something that we tasted that left a bitter taste, and I'm not just talking about culinary stuff. Things happen in life, and it leaves a bitter taste in our lives. Um, when we talk about bitterness, the word usually gets defined as, first of all, something that is extreme. Like it, it was a bitter cold, and something that is harsh and painful. It was a bitter truth to hear. It's, it's something that seems unjust. It's, it's something that seems unfair. And so our way to process that, if we're not cautious, is just to give place to and vent to bitterness. And every one of us are susceptible to this. Uh, 
bad things happen to us. And that's one thing. But bitterness can happen in us. That's another thing. It's very common. So what can we learn from Scripture about bitterness that will help us? And the first is, is that bitterness is a root that grows unseen. That's what Hebrews author says, right? He says, beware a root of bitterness. Roots grow underground. Uh, they have incredible strength. Uh, a root system can hold up a very tall and powerful tree. But roots can also penetrate and do damage to other structures. In fact, uh, there have been pipes and, and, and foundations that have experienced a great deal of damage from a root system. And, and what I discovered is that roots technically don't break down concrete or, or, or stone. But what they do is anywhere there's a crack that's already existing, it works its way in and then just begins to expand and makes the crack even worse. So there's this root thing that can happen with bitterness, but it's not just a root, it's also a fruit thing. It's a fruit that can contaminate a lot of people. He says a lot of people can be defiled by the bitter root that is produced in our lives. Now, the obvious way that we think about defiling people with our bitterness is by convincing them that somebody else did wrong to us and they should be shunned or punished. And that happens. But it's not the only way. You can actually never call that person out and still become intensely bitter. And it will have an incredibly corrosive effect on all of your relationships. Uh, bitterness is one of those things that when it's in you, it doesn't just come out when you want it to. It bears a fruit that contaminates a lot of people. So, so what, what can we do about this? Well, uh, let's figure out what, it, what we think is happening when we're becoming bitter. Right? And the first thing I want you to see is this, is that bitterness sometimes feel like a wound that even God can't heal. Bitterness can be caused because we, we feel like we've suffered a wound that God has not healed and may not be able to heal. The, the pain seems to remain. Time doesn't reduce its intensity. Even when we think about the event that caused all of this, our memory stays pretty fresh over time. Like, there's lots of things we forget, but if you've ever been uh, treated in a very unjust, unfair way, we rewind and replay that, and that mem memory stays incredibly vivid to us over time. So, so we feel like there's a wound, and we're not healing. Even God hasn't healed it, but it doesn't stop there. We also feel like there's a loss that God can't restore. Someone took something from us, and it's never going to be replaced. I'm not going to get that back. They took away my opportunity. They took away that, that option for that relationship. They took away, and we see this incredible loss that we cannot recover from. So bitterness is difficult to avoid in our heart because, and this is really important, because we feel right. See, when you do something wrong, you feel guilty. But when someone does something wrong to you, you just feel right. And that's a really risky place to plant your feet. It's amazing what people will do when they feel right. So how do you know if you are a bitter person? Well, you could ask somebody who knows you well, and they may tell you the truth if they're feeling particularly courageous that day. But what are some other key markers? Bitter people tend to hold on to grudges. Yeah, that's a thing. Bitter people tend to feel stuck in the past. They can't seem to exercise different options in the present or hope for a different future. And bitter people tend to avoid cheerful people. They don't want to be around them. And in the shadow of that bitterness, our heart gets hidden and becomes hard. And this is a very unhealthy an unenviable way to live. Uh, in, when your heart starts getting hard, you forget the good things, but never the bad things. So, I think that you were actually, all of us, that we were created for more than just breathing. I don't think that God created us to play small and run scared. I don't think that's why we're here. We have been created to love and to laugh and to live in freedom. You have a grander purpose in your life than nursing old wounds or avo avoiding new ones. 
There's something God wants to do in our lives. Our bitter tears will blur the vision of what's possible, but grace is what reinstates it for us. Now, bitterness is not, this is hard to hear, and, and I wish I didn't have to tell you, bitterness is not the result of what has been done to you. Bitterness is the result of how we respond to what has been done to us. That's what makes it so hard. So there's lots of stories in Scripture that refer to people experiencing this. This is one of the most common human emotions you can possibly imagine. And so the, the, there's lots of options to pick from. The, the one I chose today is a story that actually occurs in Exodus, the 15th chapter. The nation of Israel had spent generations in bondage. I mean, parents, their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren had known nothing but being slaves. And the day came when they were finally liberated from that slavery, when, when God, by supernatural action, pried the fingers of the Egyptians off of them, and they, they left Egypt, and they took livestock with them. And, and, and all of a sudden, Pharaoh has a change of heart, and he sends out military troops to either drag them back or destroy them in the wilderness. And it's at the Red Sea where this amazing thing happens. God opens up a miraculous path in the sea for the entire nation to walk through. And those of the military troops who pursued the nation of Israel wound up actually drowning in the sea. So you would think this would be a, a, a reason to really celebrate. They're not slaves anymore. Their enemy has been defeated. They're, they're out of the land of bondage. This is all good, except... They didn't have a ready water source. They'd been walking for three days, and the water that they came across was actually bitter, it was undrinkable. And so when they came across that water, and it takes a lot of water to take care of an entire nation and their livestock. And so they, they come across this water, and, and it's bitter. So what did they do? They vent bitterness towards Moses. Now, please understand, they didn't drink the water. They couldn't. It wasn't the bitter water that made them bitter. It was the bitter water that revealed their bitterness. Years of mistreatment and disappointment cracked the cistern of their heart, and it just flowed out with a venomous stream, and Moses is the one who's taking it all. And Moses didn't know what to do. So he gives us a really good piece of advice here. When you don't know what to do, pray. It's, he just goes to God. And God does a really interesting thing. God shows him a tree. And so he takes that tree and he casts it into the water. And the bitter water was made sweet. It was actually became drinkable for people. Now, there's all kinds of people who will look at that story and they'll say, well, that's kind of silly. There's other people in science who say there's actually some wood properties that will take away the brackishness of water. And, and so there are people who say, well, I don't know if it's a miracle or not. The miracle is that God showed Moses what to do, not just that the water was, was made sweet. And so he responds, and, and God leads the nation of Israel forward from there. But he showed them a tree. What's really interesting is that all the people who uh, are commentators throughout church history and who've studied Scripture and, and tried to understand theology, they all agree that this is actually a reference. It's a, it's a foreshadowing. It's a picture, a, a metaphor of, of the cross of Christ, that when we bring our bitterness to God, that there's something he accomplished on a tree that brings healing to us. You see, Jesus was the one who was falsely accused and convicted of crimes that he absolutely did not commit. And he was subjected to torture and he was crucified on a tree. And that picture tells us that when we are going through such things, the source of our healing is not just the act of our will. But it's coming to the one that when what he did for us enters our life, it takes bitterness and it can make it sweet again. Christ is the source of our healing. But Christ also shows us a different way to process these painful realities. So what does he show us? Well, to walk free of bitterness, learn to pray for people rather than about people. Have you ever prayed about someone? Uh, the, the collective answer is yes. 
We all have. Have you ever informed God about what someone else was doing they shouldn't be doing? Especially if they were doing it to you? As though somehow God missed that. Like he's the teacher that you had in fourth grade who didn't notice when the kid was giving you a hard time every time her back or his back was turned away from you. God understands what's going on. But sometimes we complain to God about someone. That's not the same thing as praying for them. And what does Jesus do on the cross? He says, Father, he doesn't say, do you see what they're doing to me here? He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, that's a really hard statement to process because no one is ever accidentally crucified. You don't trip over something and get crucified. The kind of intentional, maniacal, murderous, consistent, unending effort it requires to put a person through that, there's no way there's a lack of intentionality. So what is Jesus telling us? Jesus is telling us that there's more going on than just an intention to carry out an action. There's things that they don't understand. They don't understand what Jesus is there for or what he is doing. They don't understand the forces that are driving their own murderous hearts. They don't understand the consequences of their actions. They don't understand the darkness that is within them. They have a bunch of bottled up bitterness that is now being unleashed on the only one who can absorb it without becoming coming bitter or retaliating. That's what they don't understand. And when you pray for someone, you, I know I've, I've, I've struggled with this myself where I, I go to pray for someone and I wind up praying about them and I, I, I start praying like this, God, you see what they're doing. There's no way that's right. Where's the God of justice right now? And... Here's what I want you to know. There's still a way to pray for them. You, we could pray that they will see truth in a way that will actually transform their heart. We could pray that God will do something in their heart to help them become more compassionate. We could pray that they will discover God's given purpose because once you're pursuing that, it's amazing what you have to leave behind. We could pray that they would stop passing on the bitterness in their soul to others. We can pray for them. Now, here's what I will tell you. This is kind of a bad news, good news thing. You ready? The prayers you pray for someone else may not change them, but it will always change you. That's what we have to remember. He also prayed, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So we have to learn to commit our future to God. It, it's amazing how much we believe that our future is determined and controlled by other people. It explains a lot of what we do and what we don't do because we think other people are deciding for us what options are available to us. But Jesus prays, into your hands I commit my spirit. Uh, there, it, by every appearance, the people who are inflicting torture on Jesus are determining what is left of his future. But God has other plans. His plan was not to protect his son from crucifixion. His plan was to provide redemption through it. That just messes with us. We would prefer a model of spirituality where if I do the right thing, only good things happen. And what I can tell you is this is not heaven. In heaven, we don't have pain and sorrow and all the things we contend with. But here, this is a dark world. It is a place that is, is filled with sadness and grief and, and, and malicious intent and all the things that we would prefer to avoid. But Jesus shows us how grace is released into our world. Crucifixion, even crucifixion couldn't stop grace from being released into our world because of what he suffered, who he trusted, and how he responded. That's how grace gets released. Grace will not guarantee you no suffering, but how we suffer and who we trust and how we respond. And this is the thing you have to understand 
when life seems unfair, you're going to either trust God or blame God. That's where we eventually get. Eventually, we will stop saying, they did this to me, and we'll start saying, you allowed this. It's a really challenging place for us to be spiritually. So we live in a broken and dark world. Lots of things happen. What's interesting is that Jesus didn't pretend anything, but he did pray. He didn't deny the pain. He acknowledges that. He also doesn't use the pain as an excuse to do something inexcusable to someone else. What the cross shows us is that we don't have to be defined by what has been done to us by others. We can be defined by what has been done for us by God at the cross. That's the distinction. That's why, just like that story in Exodus, once the cross enters the bitterness of our lives, something becomes sweet again. You were made for more than breathing. You have not been created to play small and run scared. You were created to love and to laugh and to live in freedom. There's a grander purpose than nursing wounds or avoiding new ones. Grace can give you your vision back. Let's bow our heads this morning. Talking about a topic like this is is super risky because it can come across as though what I'm saying is that what happened to you that was done by others doesn't matter. And that's not what I'm saying. What I'm telling you is, is that it doesn't have to control your future. that as painful and unfair, as unjust as the things that have been done to you, that the people who did that didn't have more power than God. That in spite of all the pain and all the difficulty, he still has a future for you and his plans haven't changed. He's got good things for you. If we can wipe away the tears of bitterness long enough to get a fresh glimpse of what God has for our lives, I think it would breathe a lot of wind back into our sails. I think it would help us take at least one more step. I don't know how to lay hold of a future without letting go of something of the past. And here's the most astonishing thing. For all that was done to you, they've not been able to keep a grip on you. You can let go of it. Right now, you can let go of it. I'm not asking you to pretend anything. I'm not asking you to pretend like it doesn't hurt. I'm just asking you to consider the possibility that their intention for your life is not greater than God's intention for your life and their power is limited and his power is not and he is at work in this moment. If you are willing, if you're willing, just let go. So Father, oh, we struggle with this a lot. This is hard. The memories don't seem to fade and the pain seems very real. We have experienced horrible things at the hands of others. But you still hold us in your hand. You have not forgotten. You have not forsaken. And you will not. Today we choose to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just stand with me this morning.